All right, tonight we will be in Amos chapter 2. Well, chapter 1 and 2, we're going to look at both of them. And uh, I'm going to tell you up front, I've been struggling with this for two days now, how to, how to present this, what exactly to say. And I, didn't wanna, I don't want to go through this like verse by verse because uh, a lot of it, 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 it's all applicable, applicable. That's not the point. But for time, I just don't want to go through it verse by verse. But I want to look at some high points in it and uh, just look at some things in general that we need to, to get from this. And the theme of it, if you remember from last week's study, is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, and it's the Lord speaking through Amos, <coughs> particularly to Israel, which is the northern kingdom, but he's also speaking to all the nations that are around Israel and to Judah, which is the southern kingdom, and then he focuses in on Israel and deals with them. It's the day of the Lord, and that is when the day of the Lord comes to a nation. And that's what he tells them all. And we looked at several things last week, some highlights in it, things that, the, that Amos used to repeat over and over. Uh, for example, um, I will not relent from punishing. He, he mentioned that all the way through the first two chapters for three sins, three crimes, and even four, and the Lord has spoken. And he used these things over and over to point out the seriousness and the finality of the judgment that he was about to pronounce on them. And so in verse 2, after Amos has introduced himself, in verse 2 of chapter 1, he said, The Lord roars from Zion and makes his voice heard from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the summit of Carmel withers. And when he says that, the Lord roars, there's a, a couple of words in the Hebrew that are translated, that can be translated roars. And they normally deal with animals, as you might expect. And in this case, the word that is translated roars is the word that if, if a lion was, was crouched down and he was about to pounce on you, that would be the roar. It would be that roar to, to scare you, to frighten you to a point that, that you would be so scared you couldn't run, you couldn't move, you couldn't do anything as he pounced on you. And that's what that word means. And so this, the Lord, again, is giving them that, that final word. This is it. This is the roar of, of attack. The Lord would say, here I come. But notice that he says it's from Zion, and then he uses the word he makes his voice heard from Jerusalem. And we know from other studies now that, that Jerusalem is the place that God has chosen on earth as his. He has chosen Jerusalem. He has chosen the land of Israel. Solomon built him a temple because that's where his presence, the Shekinah glory, had chosen to dwell. And so when Amos gives this message, he's giving it from the standpoint that the Lord is on earth in his dwelling place and he's looking at you. He's watching. He sees. He knows. But think about this also, and this is going to come up in chapter 2 when he goes specifically to Israel. Israel had rejected the worship in Jerusalem and the temple. Remember, back when Jeroboam became king, after Solomon died, Rehoboam and Jeroboam split, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. And Jeroboam decided, he said, you know what? He said, if I don't do something, these people are all going to go to Jerusalem to worship, and a lot of them are going to stay down there. And so he established a false religion there in, in Israel. He put a golden calf one in the tribe of Dan, one at Bethel, and he told all the people his words exactly, just like what they said in Exodus. He said, Israel, here is your God. Worship them. And then he appointed priests, and he sent them all throughout the area to keep the people here. So here comes Amos, a prophet from the southern kingdom. He comes to the northern kingdom, and he begins to speak to them, and the first thing he tells them is he said, God in Jerusalem, the Lord in Jerusalem. So this has got to kind of fly in their face. It'd be kind of like uh, growing up playing football in Nacogdoches. Lufkin was our 
arch enemy, you know, and, and it, it was so bad almost to the point that if we lost every game of the season, if we just beat Lufkin, that would be a, a good season. And it would be like me going over to Lufkin and telling Lufkin, you know, just running them down, telling them how sorry they are right there in Lufkin. That wouldn't be very smart. And that's kind of what Amos is doing. And he's going over into the camp of the enemy, and he's telling them, look, you've messed up. You left Jerusalem. You're not worshiping the true God. And all of these people now are hearing his word of judgment against them. And as he begins his, his proclamation of judgment, all of these different nations, from each nation, the pronouncement of doom follows the same pattern. We saw that last week, a general declaration that God's judgment is coming and it's final and he ended every one of them with the Lord has spoken some of the the King James would say thus saith the Lord and so he's, he's telling them this word is final and then not only that he names what they've done the specific sin the violation of God's word and then he gives them a description of God's punishment that's going to come upon them and so I think he does this for a couple of reasons. I think he does it, he names their sin so that they'll know he's serious. They'll know that, hey, how does he know that? If he knows that, he must really be a prophet of God. And then he tells them what the punishment's going to be, what God's going to do to them. So when it happens, they can't turn around and say, well, our God did this or or this God over here did this, they'll know that the God, Jehovah God of Jerusalem, did this. And I remember there's another time in, in the book of Isaiah that God was dealing with Israel, and he said, I'll tell you these things beforehand so that when they happen, you can't say that your God did it. All you can say is that I did it. So sometimes you might hear people pray or or you might hear me pray sometime on Sunday morning in, in my pastor's prayer that we God do something or, or work in somebody's life and he do it in such a way that there's no question that it was him that did it. Because so many times we lay things off to coincidence. We lay things off to, well, that, that's just the way it happened. And you'll see a lot of times people will be under conviction during a, a, a certain period of time. And maybe they don't commit themselves to Christ during that time for whatever reason. And then later on when you go and talk to them, they can come up with all kinds of reasons. Well, you know, it was a coincidence or it just happened that way. That really wasn't something of God. And that's why so many times when God does something. As a matter of fact, we're going to see in Amos, it's one of my favorite verses. In Amos chapter 5. Hang on a second. The Lord says that he does nothing without first telling his prophets. And he does that so that nobody can come back and say when it happened that he didn't do it, that it wasn't his hand that did it. Now, when he gets down, beginning in verse 3, and I'm not going to read all of this. I'll just read the first one. Beginning in verse 3, he says, The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Damascus for three crimes, even four, because they threshed Gilead with iron sledges. Okay, just real quick, the iron sledges. When they were getting ready to harvest certain crops out in their field, they made this sled. It was just like an old sled out of wood. They weighted it down on top with rocks, and then underneath it, it had these iron hooks these teeth that came out and they would pull it through the crops and those teeth would cut the stalks and, and lay the crop down and then they would come along and gather it up. And apparently what Gilead did is there, or what Damascus did to Gilead is when they won the battle and took them as hostages, they laid the people down and they ran over them with that. And that's the, the picture that, that is given here. They tortured their enemies. And when you read through all of these, every one of them are committing crimes against humanity. That's the best way I know to put it. 
If you'll read every one of these, God charges them with something that they did to another nation or to another people. And so that's why I call it crimes of humanity. Uh, for example, uh, verse 9, the Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Tyre for three crimes, even for four. Why? Because they handed over a whole community of exiles to Edom and broke the treaty of brotherhood. So what did they do? They took a whole community and basically they sold them as slaves. So all the way through this, it's all got to do with crimes against other people. It's got to do with, with crimes that they committed when they knew better, and I'm going to show you in just a minute how they knew better. They knew better than to treat other people this way, but they did it anyway. And so this leads to the thought that they, the Gentile nations listed, have violated, and here's what I want to talk about for a few minutes tonight, the everlasting covenant. Now, somebody, you might be thinking, okay, well, Brother Don, what's the everlasting covenant that the Gentiles violated? So if you would, first of all, go back to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, and this is Noah after he gets out of the ark. And the Lord begins to speak to him. And we'll begin reading in verse... Uh, Verse 1, let's begin reading in verse 1, Genesis chapter 9. And he says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fear the earth. Okay, this is after the flood now. So how many people are on the face of the earth? Eight. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. And that's it. Nobody else. So when the Lord in just a minute says, Noah's descendants, he's making a covenant with Noah and his descendants, he's talking about everybody because everybody is descended from Noah. Everybody. So he says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. The fear and terror of you will be in every living creature on earth, every bird of the sky, every creature that crawls on the ground, all the fish of the sea, they are all placed under your authority. Every creature that lives and moves will be food for you. As I gave the green plants, I have given you everything. However, you must not eat meat with its lifeblood in it. Now, verse 5, he says, And I will require a penalty for your lifeblood. I will require it from any animal and from any human. If one murders a fellow human, I will require that person's life. Whoever sheds human blood... By humans, his blood will be shed, for God made humans in his image. But you, be fruitful and multiply, spread out over the earth and multiply on it. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, Understand that I am establishing my covenant with you and with who? Descendants. Your descendants after you. So this is a covenant that God is making and basically, you could say with mankind. And when you go back and you read what he said, the principal thing in the covenant is, number one, be fruitful and multiply. Number two, don't murder. Don't kill each other. That's the two primary things in this covenant. He says again, verse 9, understand that I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, birds and livestock and all the wildlife of the earth that are with you, all the animals of the earth that come out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again will every creature be wiped out by flood waters. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. And then verse 12 through the following is he gives them the sign of this covenant, which is the rainbow. So God makes a covenant with people, Noah and his descendants after him, when they come out of the ark, and that descendant is, is that you are to walk before me in my ways, you are to be fruitful and multiply and don't kill. And why are we not supposed to kill? One simple reason. People are made in God's image. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what race, what state in life they are. 
they are created in God's image. And so when you kill, you are, in effect, striking out against God. Now, take this with understanding, because even in the, the Ten Commandments, the Bible does not say, thou shalt not kill. It says, thou shalt not murder. Okay, the English, it's weak translation there. Ecclesiastes, there is a time to kill, there's a time to heal. All the way through Scripture, you see various things. Even when you get into the New Testament, Paul in the book of Romans and in a couple of other places lays out the function of the government, and part of the function of the government is to bear the sword. Okay, and even, even in his covenant, notice what he says back in verse 5, about halfway through. He says, if someone murders a fellow human... I will require that person's life. So there's a time for killing, but murder, just killing somebody because you want to or because they've got something, God says don't do it. And he made a covenant with all of mankind. Now that brings us to something else. Turn now to Isaiah chapter 24. This passage is always not troubled me, but it's always been kind of a, a point of interest for me. I've always been digging on this passage and trying to get a good grip on it. Isaiah chapter 24, and let's begin reading in verse 1. He says, Look, the Lord is stripping the earth bare, making it desolate. He will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants, people and priests alike. Servant and master, female servant and mistress, buyer and seller, leader and borrower, creditor and debtor. The earth will be stripped completely bare and will be totally plundered for the Lord has spoken this message. Verse 4, the earth mourns and withers. The world wastes away and withers. The exalted people of the earth waste away. Now watch verse 5. The earth is polluted by its inhabitants. For they have transgressed teachings, overstepped decrees, and broken the permanent or everlasting covenant. Now, what covenant do you think that is? The only covenant that I know of in Scripture that applies to all people is the covenant God made with Noah. That's the only one. And probably one of the major curses in this world today is murder and it has been since the beginning of time Cain and Abel and we see places where he's going to tell back in our text in uh, Amos he's going to tell Gilead he said uh, was it Gilead yeah. one of them is that they ripped up pregnant women to kill the babies. And he says, and you did it just to get more land. So you and see... That was Edom. Huh? Edom. Edom, okay. I, I knew it was in there. I just, and I didn't 11. mark that particular thing. In 11. Verse, Verse 11. 11. Yeah, because they ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to enlarge their territory. It had nothing to do with the people. They were just killing indiscriminately because they wanted the land. And it's that lack of... It's that lack of care for life. It's that lack of respect for life. And remember, that respect goes back to God because God said, man, people are created in my image. And that's why when we look at the news, and remember I told you Sunday morning that uh, I just, well, Saturday evening, I just got flat depressed looking at my news feeds because of all of the murder and the hatred. And if take it to that step. Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. So all of that, and that's what he's judging them for. You know, they've done a lot of things. Remember he said for three crimes, yea, for four. So they've done a lot of things. But the one that he points out in every one of these pagan nations is crimes against humanity. 
mostly it's murder. And so you would say, okay, well, if this is a covenant that they've broken, which I'm saying it is, I'm saying it's the everlasting covenant that God made in Genesis through Noah to all of his descendants, how do they know about it? Because they're Gentiles. They're not like Israel and Judah. They don't have prophets coming to them only on rare occasions. For example, Jonah going to Nineveh. Uh, they, they don't have the God's temple with, with the Torah in the temple. They don't have everything. How can they know this and how can they be responsible if they don't know it? Well, I'll tell you how they know it. The Bible speaks clearly to this even in the New Testament. The Bible teaches us, and we'll look at one if you want to go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 2, that the Gentiles, even though they have not received what we will call special revelation, like the Jews did, they still had what Paul calls God's laws written on their hearts. Okay, and now for, just for conversation's sake, we would call it a conscience. There are some times when you're doing stuff and you just, you just know better than to do it. Your conscience, what we cut, bothers you. And that's what Paul says. Look at Romans chapter 2, uh, verses 14 and 15. Paul says, so when Gentiles who do not by nature have the law of God, in other words, they don't have the book Torah, they don't have the Bible, they don't have the prophets, but when they do what the law demands... They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Now watch what he says. Their consciences confirm this. Their competing thoughts are either accusing or excusing them. So God designed us to know certain things. And when he made that covenant Back in Genesis 9 again, with Noah, down to his descendants, it wasn't just something arbitrary. It wasn't something that, that Noah was going to have to teach his kids, and his kids teach their kids, and their kids, and, and pass it on down. It wasn't like that. God said, I'm going to handle it this way. I'm going to make a covenant with everybody, and I'm going to put it in their hearts. You're going to know right from wrong, and every one of us do. How many times have you seen one of your kids when they were little or maybe a grandkid, they do something, and then the first thing they do is look to see if you saw them? I, I still remember my kids doing that, and I watch my grandkids do it now. Or they'll look to see if you're looking, and if you're looking, they'll just stand there. And then the minute they think you're not looking, here they go. It's in their head. They know God put it there. God designed us that way. So when these nations, back in Amos, when these nations did the things that they did, they were not only going against God, they were going against their conscience. And you'll say, well, some people, uh, they, just, they just kill without, uh, for example, Hitler. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, too, that one that was in the United States, and he, he was eating them. He was killing them and eating them. And John Wayne Gacy? I don't think that's the right name, but, but what, what about them? Well, Paul gives us an answer for that, and he says that they have seared their conscience. They have gone so long disobeying their conscience, doing the things that they know were wrong till they get to the point where they no longer hear that conscience voice that God gave us doesn't bother them anymore they just they don't know right from wrong anymore and that's what's important is the anymore they knew it to start with turn back to Romans chapter 1 just a page back and I'll show you what I'm talking about Romans chapter 1 beginning verse 18 it says for God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by the unrighteousness suppress the truth. So right off the bat, what are they doing? They know the truth, 
but they're suppressing it. They're trying to, to keep it down. Verse 19, since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. So there's not a person, according to Scripture, there's not a person born on this earth that doesn't know two things. Number one, he doesn't know there's a God. Everybody knows there's a God. Number two, he knows right from wrong because God has put it in us. Then in verse 21, here's your answer. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their useless hearts, and you can put conscience in right there, was darkened. And Paul says, before we be too hard on, on sinners and unrighteous people, Paul says that even Christians, even born-again Christians, can quench the Holy Spirit within them. We can go in sin, even though the Holy Spirit's convicting us and telling us not to do it, and keep going and keep going until we get to the point that we no longer hear the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So that's why they were judged. Crimes against humanity, things that they knew naturally, it was born in them not to do, they did anyway. And as a result, they incurred God's wrath. Now you'll notice back in Amos, you'll notice that when he gets down in chapter 2, he begins in verse 4 with Judah. And then verse 6, with Israel, it's a little bit different. And it's also going to be, if, if you'll study this out and follow it on through some of the other prophets, which we will as we go through this study, he's going to be harder on Judah and Israel than he is on the others. With Judah, beginning in uh, verse 4 of chapter 2, the Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Judah, for three crimes, even for four, because they have rejected the instruction of the Lord and have not kept his statutes. The lies that their ancestors followed have led them astray. Therefore, I will send fire against Judah, and it will consume the citadels of Jerusalem. Now, notice one thing right away. See, we didn't read all of the others, so I won't hold you to it. But if you'll notice, after verse 5, after he has pronounced judgment, he does not say the Lord has spoken like he did with all the other nations. He doesn't say that with Judah. With all the other nations, when he said it, the Lord has spoken, it was final. All those other nations were either destroyed or taken captive out of their land and sent somewhere else by Assyria shortly after this happened, probably within the next 100 to 150 years. All of these nations cease to exist. Have you ever heard the saying, and I know a lot of people don't like it, but I happen to think it's true, there are things that are worse than death? Okay? Israel might agree with that. All of these other nations, they're dead. They're gone. They're destroyed off the face of the earth. Syria came back in another form, and they're, they're now the Syria that we know of. <coughs> But all these other peoples are gone. But look at what has happened to Israel through all these years, all these centuries, all the suffering they've endured, everything that they've gone through. That's why the Lord didn't say, this is the word of the Lord, because he wasn't through with them. Now, you've got to take into account, okay, that Israel, and when I say Israel in this sense, I mean Israel and Judah, God's people, they are God's people. God still has a plan and a purpose for them, even in our future. There's work. There's things that God's going to do with them and through them. But in this case, they might testify to you and say, it would have been better if we'd have just been destroyed back on that day because of what they had to go through. Now look 
at what God accuses them of. He doesn't accuse them of murder, even though they did. He doesn't accuse them of all the other things like he does the other nations. He accuses them of a very simple thing. And he said, because you have rejected the instruction of the Lord and have not kept his statutes. Who was it on the face of the earth that received God's word? The Jews. Who was it on the face of the earth that had the temple where God's presence dwelt? The Jews. If anybody should have walked with the Lord. It was the Jews. If anybody should have shunned the ways of the world and, and, and ran. Remember, that's what God said about Job. He said, Job's a righteous man. He says he's good. And one of the things he said in his description is, and he shuns evil. That should have been the testimony of the Jews. And just to be honest with you, that should be the testimony of you and me tonight. Because we are God's people. We have God's special revelation. None of us have any excuse for any sin that we commit. The only excuse we have is, I just did it. That's it. Because we know better. We have the Holy Spirit. We have conscience. We have the Word of God. And so when God judges them, when God speaks against them, it's because they knew the Lord's word. They had the Lord's word, and they rejected it. So the worst sin that the Lord's people can do is to depart from the Lord's word. And their highest virtue is obedience to the Lord's word. That's another reason that I have today with some of these, and I don't know what to call them, so-called preachers you see on TV today and some of the things they're preaching, some of our churches, and I'm not talking about the problems that are happening now with the Methodists about dividing over LGBTQ and all that stuff. I'm talking about churches that are supposed to be, one of them that I've got in mind right now is a Southern Baptist church. But you watch that dude preach on TV or on YouTube and it's a joke. And some of the things that they do and they promote. Look at Andy Stanley and some of the things he's doing. And it, folks, it, it, it grieves me because God judges his people based on his word. On what they do with his word. And then in verses 6 through 8, he deals with Israel, the northern kingdom. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Israel for three crimes, even for four. And then he gets on to them for crimes against humanity. He says, "For because they sell a righteous person for silver and a needy person for a pair of sandals. They trample the heads of the poor on the dust of the ground and obstruct the path of the needy. A man and his father have sexual relations with the same girl profaning my holy name. They stretch out beside every altar on garments taken as collateral, and in the house of their God they drink wine that they obtain through fines. If you take time to run your references on all of these charges, every one of them is a direct violation against God's law somewhere in the first five books, every one of them. God had outlined, and he says, don't do this, don't do that. And every one of them, they did. They violated. They went against it. But notice something, because now here comes the good part. Amen? Here comes the good part. Notice verse 9 through 12. And now God is going to remind them of all of the things that he's done for them. And to me, this is a plea for repentance. Repentance. Because when we get over into uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4, one of the things that I've got underlined where he tells them two or three times, he says, but you did not return to me. But you did not return to me. So he's giving them opportunity for repentance. Listen to what he says. He says, yet I destroyed the Amorite as Israel advanced. His height was like the cedars, and he was as sturdy as the oaks, and I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. You remember when the 12 spies went over into the land? 
and they came back with their report. Of course, Joshua and Caleb said, let's go. We can take it. You remember what one of the main things the ten said? They said they were giants over there. We looked like grasshoppers in our eyes to them. And the Lord says, yeah, they were. But look what he says. I destroyed the Amorite as Israel advanced. His height was like cedars, and he was sturdy as oaks. But I destroyed him. Now, think about this from a human standpoint. Yes, the Lord destroyed the Amorites, the giants. But who actually did the fighting? Israel did. The people. They went in there. They followed the Lord. They did under Joshua and Caleb's leadership. They did what God told them to do, and they destroyed the giants. Now, I'll never forget uh, Caleb. Uh, one of my favorite stories, after everything was settled and done and Joshua's given his, his final speech, Caleb comes up to him and he says, Caleb, he says, you remember when we came back from that, that spy trip and we gave a good report Moses told me that the Lord said that every place that my foot tread, he would give me. And all this time, I've been out fighting everybody else's battles and helping everybody else take their land. And he says, that mountain is mine, now give it to me. And Joshua said, Caleb, he said, there's some giants over there. And he said, some of them are entrenched with iron chariots. Caleb said, I'm 80-something years old. And he said, my strength is not abated. I can still weld a sword like the youngest man we've got. He said, give me my mountain. Joshua said, go take it. Caleb went and took the mountain. Now, who took the mountain? Caleb did. How did he do it? Through faith and obedience to the Lord. And so when the Lord says here, he says, I did this. I destroyed the Amorites. Yes, he did. But he's making a point to them. He did it through them. And all of these things back up here that he has accused them of, if, if they would have just stopped for a minute and said, wait, wait, this is wrong. If they would have just stopped and said, Lord, help us, the Lord would have helped them. They would have been able to overcome these things and done the right thing. Verse 10, he said, I brought you from the land of Egypt. I led you for 40 years in the wilderness in order to possess the land of the Amorite. I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is this not the case, Israel? This is the Lord's declaration. So again, he's, he's pleading with them, look, remember what I did. Remember how I worked. Remember how I blessed you. I, I provided for you. And, and the psalmist says that for 40 years in the wilderness, their shoes didn't wear out and their feet didn't swell. And God's reminding them of all of this. And what he's trying to get them to do is say, stop, Israel. Remember the Lord we serve. Remember his grace and his mercy. And let's turn back to him. That's what he's trying to get them to do. Sometimes when you get in trouble, sometimes when you get in a bind, maybe you need to stop and say, Lord, help me to remember. Remind me of what you have done and how you have blessed me. Remind me of how I got from where I was to where I am now so that when my heart wants to stray, when my thoughts want to go away, that I can come back to you and I can say, the Lord has brought me this far and he will see me through the rest of the way. We're going to stop there for tonight. And that's what he's trying to get Israel to do. It, God does not want to judge them. I showed you that and we're going to see it again later on in Amos where God begins to pronounce judgment and Amos cries out and he says, Lord, stop. Israel so little, how can they survive? And the Lord says, okay, I'll stop. So it's not his heart to judge. And had Israel repented and turned, had Israel just simply stopped and said, yes, Lord, you did all of that. You've blessed us. You've been good to us. And so we want to give ourselves to you and serve you. He would have done it. 
but they didn't. And he's going to point that out in the next couple of verses, their response. So, Any questions, any comments on anything tonight? Remember, God made a covenant with you whether you're a Christian or not. And that covenant is the everlasting covenant, and you will answer for it, just like these other nations did. How we treat other people. Anything? Well, thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, I'm still 